Okay folks, for this video we're going to talk about root locus. There are a couple equations that you need to know to do one. Uh, overall, the root locus itself is fairly simple. So the first question is, is, is why root locus? Well, we saw in, in a couple different chat, uh, a couple videos back about Ralph Hurwitz, which determines uh, bounds on stability. Um, but it also, it really just tells you the value, the quantitative value of what K can be before it, it blows up, right? So the, the example problem that people typically give you is you have a controller K and you actually have a, uh, a third order system. Let's do something simple. So you have three poles at the origin, okay? And I want to know the bounds on stability, okay? So now you could close the loop and get a third order transfer function and do a Ralph table and then find the bounds on stability of K. And that's totally fine. But what if I actually want to draw where the poles move as they go through um, the, the, the PZ math plane, okay? Um, I kind of, I kind of want to do. I, I, I'd like to do this problem, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. So uh, let's just, let's just uh, leave this as an aside for a second. If you instead take this problem, right, k, and instead of making it third order, just do it second order. So if you do three s plus one, s plus two. If you close the loop on this, you're going to get 3k over, and I'm going to factor this out fairly quickly, you're going to get s squared plus 3s plus 2 plus k. Uh, might, there might be a 3k, I think it's 3k. Right, because you're going to get cg over 1 plus cgh, okay, and in this case h is 1. And if you look at this actually, it's interesting because this is quadratic, so if you wanted to write the poles of the system, you would just do negative 3 halves plus or minus 1 half square root of 9 minus 4 times 3k plus 2. And you could start plugging in numbers. If you plugged in k equals 0, you would get negative 3 halves plus or minus 3 halves. Is that right? K, no, no, because you get a minus 8, so you get negative 3 halves plus or minus 1 half if k was 0. And then you could increase k, and you could plug in more values. So if k were 0, you would get negative 3 halves plus or minus 1 half, which would be negative 4 halves, which is negative 2, and then um, negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. So you would just get negative 1 and negative 2, which is interesting because when k is 0, you actually just get your open loop poles, okay? Now, what happens when k is really, really big? Well, when k is really big, this whole term becomes imaginary, right? And if it's imaginary, your real component is going to be negative 3 halves, so that's actually right in between here at negative 1.5, and then your poles are going to move here and here. So what you can draw, and this is what a root locus is, a root locus is a graph showing parametrically where your closed loop poles move in the real imaginary plane as k increases, okay? And so there are a couple of tricks that you can learn. So the first thing that you need to do and you need to realize is what is this uh, real imaginary plane? Well, what's happening here is when you close the loop, you get cg over 1 plus cgh, okay? And this is your closed loop transfer function. Now, in order to make these poles, these poles are the solution of 1 plus CGH equals 0. Okay? Now, you can put this in a pretty easy form if you say, well, if I let CGH equal KL, where L is basically all of the transfer function stuff, all the stuff with S's, and k is just my gain parameter, then what you can write is you can write 1 plus kl equals 0. Now, the neat thing about this form is that it's very easy to draw a root locus. And the reason why is because the poles 
of L, the poles and zeros of L uh, are, are your starting point, are the starting point for uh, the root locus, okay? So basically what you do is, if you're, given, if you're given a block diagram, you compute L based on CGH, you just multiply it all together and that gives you L. And then you find the poles and zeros of L and those are your starting point for your root locus, okay? And then, how do you get this equal to zero? Well, you have to understand that K, and K times L is a complex number. One here is also a complex number but it's kind of weird how you draw it. It's, it's, uh, one is a complex number where the magnitude is one and the phase is zero degrees, okay? And uh, remember, in the complex plane, everything is a vector. So it has a direction and a magnitude. And so in this case, the direction is zero, right? It's the, if you draw a complex number, a comma b, where this is a plus bi, this has a magnitude, n, and a phase, phi. So the number one has a magnitude of one and a phase of zero. So if you want this equal to zero, it means that kL has to equal negative one, right? Well, negative one is what? Well, it has a magnitude of one, but the phase is equal to minus 180, okay? And that minus 180 phase is really important when we do our root locus because what actually happens is, is that when we're doing our root locus, every point on this root locus has a magnitude of negative one and a phase of minus 180. Now the magnitude is k times the magnitude of L. So k is a variable and so k can change, but you can't change phase. So every phase on this root locus that you draw has a phase of minus 180. And we're going to use that to, to draw our root locus, our root loci, okay? So uh, I'm going to take a picture of this real quick, and then we're going to do those two examples here. Okay, so scanning. Okay. Uploading. Okay, so let's do, let's leave that there because we already kind of drew it. Let's do this column here, okay? So C, G, sorry, C, G, H is equal to K times three over S plus one, S plus two, times H, which is one, which means that L is three over S plus one, S plus two, okay? There is our L, all right? Then we find the poles and zeros of L, so the poles are negative one and negative two, and the zeros are none, okay? Then we have to do a couple interesting formulas, okay? So first, we need to compute the number of poles. So the number of poles, this is the number of poles, is two, there are two poles. M is the number of zeros, and that's one. Oh, sorry, there are none. So there are zero zeros, okay? Then comes these, uh, these two formulas here, all right? So the first one is the number of asymptotes, okay? The number of asymptotes is equal to n minus n. Okay, so for this problem, the uh, I guess I'm going to call them a. The number of asymptotes is two minus zero, so there are two asymptotes. And an asymptote is where a number goes off to infinity. And you can see here, both of these poles go off to infinity, right? So this is checking out so far. If you have asymptotes, you need to find the point at which the asymptotes cross the x-axis, and that's alpha. So this here is alpha, this point right here. 
this is alpha. Alpha is equal to the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros all over n minus n. And you can see why you have to have asymptotes to compute this equation. If you don't have any asymptotes, you're going to divide by zero and the whole thing's going to blow up. Okay? So what you do then in this case, what are your, what are your, uh, your poles? You've got negative one plus negative two minus, there are none, so I'm not going to subtract any zeros off, and then you divide this by two. So that's going to be negative three halves. There you go. And just like that, alpha is negative three halves, exactly what we got. So then you have to determine what is the angle of your asymptotes, okay? So the angle of your asymptotes, phi L, is equal to 180 degrees plus 360 L minus 1 over N minus M, where L is any number out to uh, n minus m, okay? And so in this case, that means l can be one, l can be two, and then that's it, because n minus m is two. So in our case, phi l is 180 plus 360 l minus one over two, which is 90 plus 180 l minus one. So when l is one, phi L is 90 degrees, okay, so that means one asymptote is phase of 90, and then if we do L equals 2, we get phi L is 270, and so that means our other asymptote is 270 degrees, okay? Those formulas are, are almost everything you need to draw. It'll tell you the number of asymptotes, it'll tell you the uh, break, break, breakaway point from, or the, 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 the x-axis crossover point, and it'll tell you the phase of the asymptotes themselves. There are some other things that you can compute, like breakaway angle and things like that. I'm not so much interested in that. I really just want to know, is the system going to go unstable? In this case, this root locus is never going to go unstable, okay? So then after that, you need, there's, there's a, you need to compute the phase of every point on this, okay? So there's, a, there's like the, the formulaic way to do it, and then there's like the even odd way to do it. So what you do here is you, you pick a point here, and you, can, you draw a vector from the pole to that point, and the pole to that point, and you're going to get, a, you're gonna get a, the vector from the pole here to this test point has a phase of zero, and then this pole to this vector, or this test point, also has a phase of zero. So a phase of zero plus a phase of zero is zero. That's not minus 180. So it means that every point on this number line does not exist in the um, real, uh, on the root locus. If you then go over here, and you pick a fictitious point here, or a test point, and you draw a vector from this pole to that point, that's a phase of 180 degrees. And then if you draw a vector from this one, this pole to this point, that's a phase of zero. So that means they add up to 180, which means this is part of the root locus. If you then jump over here to this point, you're gonna get 180 degree phase and 180 degree phase, and that's gonna give you 360, which is not 180, and so that doesn't exist. And so you know that this part is part of the root locus, you know that this part is where they break away, and you know the asymptotes are plus or minus 90, okay? Now the even odd way to do it is to say you, um, you look at the number of things to the right of you, okay? And in this case, the number of poles to the right is zero, so that's an even number. And so in that case, you, uh, why is my thing blinking? Oh, it's blinking because it's reported. Um, so that's zero, so it's even, so that means anything over here is not. When you put your cursor here, how many poles and zeros are to the right? Well, it's, um, it's odd, there's one, so that's part of the root locus, and then when you shoot over here, you have two to the right, and so that's even, and in that case, that's not part of it, okay? I'm gonna take a picture of this, we're gonna do this problem, and then I'm probably gonna call it for this video. How long is this video so far? Yeah, like 14 minutes. I, I don't like to keep my videos more longer than 20 minutes. Okay, so let me take a picture of this. Scan. Okay. Upload. All 
All right, so let's do let's do this problem here. Okay. Okay. First, you have, to, you have to compute L. This problem is exactly the same as the last one, so L is just the plant in this case. I'm not going to rewrite it. The number of poles are three, and they are negative one, negative two, negative three. The number of zeros is zero, or sorry, none. Yeah, the number of zeros is zero, and the, the value of the zeros are undefined, they don't exist. So the number of asymptotes is n minus m, so that means there are three asymptotes, okay? Then we have, that if, since we have asymptotes, we have to compute the breakaway point where the asymptotes break away from the real axis, and so that's going to be sum of the poles minus sum of the zeros all over n minus m. And so that's going to be negative 1 minus 2 minus 3, so that's negative 6 minus nothing over 3, so negative 6 over 3 gives me negative 2, so that's where they cross. I can go ahead and start drawing this, okay? So I'm going to have minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. It looks like I'm going, one of my asymptote is going, are going to break away from that point. The asymptote themselves are the, sorry, I already forgot the formula. It's 180 plus 360 L minus 1, N minus N. Why did I draw a 3 there? I'm sorry. So this is going to be uh, 180 over, well, N minus 1 is 3. So 180 over 3 is, ugh, that's not a whole number, is it? Or is it? Is it 60? It's 60. And then 360 over 3 is 120. So when L is 1, my, my phase angle is 60 degrees. When L is 2, my phase angle is 180 degrees. No, 120. Sorry. Oh, wait, no, sorry. You, 60 plus 120 is 180. And then when L is 3, phi of L is 120 times 2 is 240. It's 300 degrees, which is the same as minus 60. So that means I'm going to get a positive 60 degree asymptote. I'm going to get a negative 180 degree asymptote, or sorry, positive. And I'm going to get 1 over here. Now, did I do this math right? Negative 1 minus 3. Yeah, okay. Um, so where do these poles go? Okay, so now you do the uh, even odd thing. So over here, to the um, how many poles and zeros are to the right? None, so no. Over here, you've got 1 that's odd. So this is part of the root locus. Over here, even, so no. Over here, 3 is odd, so yes. Okay, so what this means is that this one obviously goes off to infinity, okay? That one just shoots off, that's an asymptote. These two eventually have to approach this asymptote, so it's pretty clear if these two come together, they'll, whenever two, whenever poles come together and meet, they split, and when they do that, they, uh, they go to their asymptotes. And so they break away from the real axis, this one's gonna go that way, and this one's gonna go that way, and what you'll find is, is that right here, this system goes unstable. So you can increase K and critically damp your system, but if you increase it too much, you will cross the imaginary axis and go unstable. And if you did a Routh table, you would be able to determine exactly that value of K that would cross you into the uh, imaginary plane. Okay? At this point, I'm going to uh, call it there and uh, post some homework uh, for those of you that are actually enrolled in this class. And uh, it's up to you to ask me questions on how to do certain problems. I didn't show any examples here in this video with zeros, um, but if you just use the formula, you'll get it. Um, zeros are kind of like black holes, and basically they remove an asymptote, and so a pole moves towards that zero. It, it takes away an asymptote, so eventually all poles end up at the zeros. And so hopefully that will help you there. But again, if you need uh, help on one of the questions for your homework, just uh, you know, post in the comments and I'll upload an example for that. Hope you enjoy this lecture and hope you have a good night.